Hey, Ashley. Thanks. I had no problem. Just a moment. I'll let the one in just a minute. I will just kind of set things up here. Okay. All right. We got 10 minutes. If people just want to turn their cameras on and introduce themselves, that'd be great too. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello, good evening. Hi, Wojtek. Nice to meet you. You are presenting, yes? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. OK, Skyler, good to see you. Hello. Yep, my name's Skyler. I'm a student at UNR. And then Alexi and Drew, good to see you. So we're going to do um, 12 minutes per presentation, right? So we got five presentations. Um, so Skylar and Adam will go first. Um, what I will do, Ashley, am I, am I host or co-host now? You should be co-host. OK, all right, cool. So, and we're recording this. Um, I am uh, flipping the switch for um, uh, multiple participants can share simultaneously. So you will just have the option to share your screen. Um, Skylar and Adam will go first, and then Pavel, Alexi, and Wojtek will go second. Um, okay. Oscar, uh, do I see Oscar yet? Not yet. Um, Not yet. It's, it, uh, is it Aubrey? Okay. Yes, Avery. Um, Avery, sorry. Yes? Okay, Avery. Um, you will go um, fourth. And uh, finally, is uh, Dominique here yet? Not yet. Dominique we still got 10 minutes. Say it one more time. I don't think Dominique is here yet. Okay. Okay. We don't know. But I will make her a co host when she's in. Okay. I'm glad everybody's participating. Uh, both um, Annika Iyer and I had undergrads that had some projects we thought it might be a good idea. So I suggested um, um, to have an undergrad session and everybody I think that was well received. Um, and hopefully this is something we can continue in the future. So I guess my understanding from the, um, the plenary this morning was that the next conference will be in Reno this fall. Is that the plan or, okay. Um, so maybe we'll be able to do this again then. There's Adam, and have some um, some more people join us. Okay. And what I will do, I guess, my virtual version of keeping time for people, um, keep your chat window open. I'll just send you a private message with warnings at um, maybe like seven five and uh, two and wrap it up. Um, I know we all have clocks in front of us, but sometimes we get lost in our presentation a little bit, right? So Alexi and Pavel and Portitek, I that I actually I think Mimit has 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 me um, on the number of trips to Poland, but I have been to Warsaw uh, 14, 17, 18, 19, 19 uh, 17, I think five times, including I spent wow. um, a, the trip in 19, like in the summer, I spent a whole uh, month in um, 
uh, in Mokotov. I, I was at the, right next to the Croatian embassy. There was a, a Villa SK hot mm -hmm. house that I got a room in. But I, I, in, uh, I guess it would have been um, time for Reno anyways. But um, yeah, disappointed that we're not traveling. I really enjoy that city. Um, it's one thing that it's really interesting when you talk to just kind of misperceptions that people have mm -hmm. in the U.S. Like I'm vegetarian or I've basically been vegan the last six months and people always assume like that must be hard to pull it. Like Warsaw has one of the best vegan food scenes in the world. So yeah, that's true. I eat... among, the, among teenagers, we've got a lot of vegetarians. There are plenty of them. Yep. So the Cravaja, I really like that burger chain. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. So I really enjoyed kind of... Um, Oh, Mokotov and kind of um, around the um, Mbe and Ha, is that the um, the right name? When um, was your last time when you were in Poland? Uh, during the um, the last conference. So it would have been, was that October of, of 19? Um, um, which my, my next to last international trip. So I was in um, Sarajevo for vacation. Uh, I might start working in that area too. December, January of 1920. So I, I managed to get in one last trip before the pandemic, but how has it been over the, does it just kind of feel kind of dead there over the last year or just, I guess every, everything is. Yeah, everything is locked down. Even county yeah. hairdressers are not opened. Uh, our government is planning to open them up on Monday, but we will see. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully this summer, once the vaccine rolls out more everywhere, yeah. it'll be hopefully. A more normal. I heard that the worst uh, situation currently is in India. They are having a nightmare. Yeah, a shortage here. We're about to hit a surplus, I think, um, mm -hmm. which is good that we have the supply, but not great that the demand isn't there. So, Pavel, good to see you. It's been a while. Hello, Todd. Hello. <laughs> so you were saying about your last uh, international trip, yes? Yeah, I made one more trip after Poland. I was in, in Bosnia for uh, the end of December and early of January of 2020. Oh. And I remember it was right when I was starting to hear on, on probably CNN or something I had on in my Airbnb about COVID starting. Um, but yeah. I, I ended travels in Europe March 6 or 7. That was the, that was the, the day basically everyone stopped. So I, I had that week. I um, was officially granted uh, tenure, turned 40, and then went into lockdown. So it's people are like, what is it like having tenure? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, I, I'm, I'm a, a great example of um, uh, faculty not working hard after tenure. I always tell people that I haven't been in the office for a full day. One day, I've spent one full day in the office since I was granted tenure. So, but working hard from home and looking forward to being back in the office more maybe over the summer, so. Okay, and we got, just looking for, we got Oscar and Dominique, I think we are still waiting for. And Ashley, I, I think I got this if you got to jump to the other session, but if you want to stay here, that's totally fine as well. And Ashley, I, you're making- Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm staying on the whole time. So okay, cool. to other technical things, I'm here. Drew is also here. We are the technical moderators. So we're here for you. Okay, and are you going to, um, you're making the, just so I know the, the tech, technical stuff, you're making the, the presenters co-host as well? Correct, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just waiting on Dominique. I don't think she's arrived yet. And she is presenting last though, so that's. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. And if she comes in, I'll make her co-host, not a problem. When we start, I think I'll just um, give a, a brief introduction and just say the authors and, and the presenter, the, pre the presentation. But if the presenter, just introduce yourself and just maybe say kind of where you are at your undergraduate studies, what you're majoring in, um, et cetera. I know we only have 12 minutes, but just maybe 30 seconds to give people some context and maybe how you got uh, involved in this collaboration. Hey, Jim. How's it going? Good, good. I'm on the road. 
you driving to work or? I'm actually out of town. Okay. Out the Mojave Desert. Nice. Is it nice. is it kind of cool there? I mean, right now, is it like? Because I know it's here seven, it's okay. Well, Seventy. So that's cool for this time of year. Yeah. Yeah. Seventy-five today. A little below normal. See a couple of yucca tree plants to my right. Emmett, good to see you. Hello, everyone. Hi, Todd. Hey, how's it going? I'm Pavel, Oscar, everybody. Ashley. Hi, hello. <laughs> oh, all friends in that session, yes? So it's a competition I, between the session three and session four. So I'm seeing a lot of discussion. So good for our students. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I was uh, there just a minute ago. So um, I, I think all sessions uh, we're having like really good numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, too, so that's great. Okay, well, since we got a, a tight schedule and it's exactly 11, we'll get started. So the first presentation will be by Skylar Louie and Adam Sporkin. Um, and they'll be talking about something I think is very interesting, uh, great way to kick this off, an interesting topic about uh, um, immigration, not immigration, international student migration from Visegrad countries. Okay. Yeah, hi. So I'm Skylar and uh, this is my partner, Adam. And um, I am a junior at UNR studying uh, economics and math. Um, and so I've kind of been doing an independent study uh, with Dr. Sorensen for, um, I think about two years now. So I'll let Adam introduce himself. Adam, um, it's like the same boat, studying a junior, studying econ and math, working with Todd. And it's been really nice, but. All right, so I will, um, share my screen all right can everyone see yes okay cool okay okay so um we looked into uh international student migration from these grad countries um to the united states and essentially and their decline over the last 10 years oops Um, so essentially, we gathered uh, gathered visa data off the State Department website, um, and we found like a general decline after 2008, and a decline after 2019 as well. Um, then we used IPOMS data just to tabulate the changes, um, and we found a sharp decline in 2008 and 2019. But just at a glance, it seems that 2008 is more severe than 2019, which we found very interesting because the world closed, <laughs> yeah. Um, next one. Um, and so the reason for this is that we did a previous work revolving around Chinese students and their internal migration to the United States. And for that, we used the herfindahl hirschman index to calculate change in overall concentration within the US. Um, and so for this conference, um, we switched our focus to the Visegrad countries um, and for this uh, research, we're focusing more on like populated regions um, at the state, region, or division level instead of the overall concentration. And some background is that uh, international students cross subsidize the tuition of domestic students, um, which is really important for like Skylar and I or um, any domestic students because it allows us to go to school cheaper thanks to these um, international students coming from abroad. Um, and then Ruiz showed us that 75% of international students come from countries with populations of 5 million or more, um, which is important because all the Visegrad countries have a population of 5 million or more. And um, these students uh, disproportionately study STEM and business, which I just thought was interesting. And um, uh, Kadena and Kovac showed that immigrants can equilibrate labor markets. Um, which is important for the uh, United States at home. So like Adam mentioned, um, we used a combination of uh, what's called IPUMS or Integrated Public Use Microdata Series data, and then also State Department data. 
Um, so in the later tables, we'll have uh, like a data data and a table, and that'll be from IPUMS. Um, and so that uses uh, census data up until 2000. And then it uses uh, American Community Survey or ACS data from uh, 2000 on. So for our um, little analysis, we used the years 2000 to 2019. Um, so now for the State Department data, um, we actually got these from PDFs off of the annual reports on the State Department website. And we just manually entered the numbers that we found uh, into an Excel spreadsheet um, from the years 2000 to 2019 for the Visegrad countries. Um, and then we made graphs out of them in Python. Um, if anyone wants to look at it, it's usually table 16 in every single annual report. Okay, so the first graph we have here is from the State Department data. And then we can see that it's uh, like relative up and down fluctuations um, up until 2019, where obviously you see a, a large drop off for everyone. Um, and I show this first graph just to show this. Um, to put this second graph into perspective. So this is kind of a zoomed out version of the first graph. Um, so this is from 2000 to 2019. Um, and you can see that there's a really deep dip actually in 2008, especially for the countries that um, have uh, more people, more students coming over, right? Um, and so you see that it actually never really recovers and 2019 actually makes the decline even worse. Um, and it never recovers to the levels pre-2008. All right, so now this is the IPUMS data that we tabulated. Um, so the way this is part is gonna work is uh, we made what's called like, I guess you can call them critical years. So we use the years 2008 to 2009 as like a critical time. And then we use the years 2015 to 2019 as a critical time. Um, so, and then we tabulated that on the region, the state, and the metro statistical area level. Um, so with these first two um, in region, 2008 to 2009 on the regional level, um, we can see that the Midwest and Northeast have a majority of the students, but then you can see that um, after the, uh, the South becomes more populated post-2008. Um, and then for 2015 to 2019, you can see that the South also rises again. It actually takes second place um, in population um, and it takes the Midwest. Um, so that's a general trend that we're gonna see at the state uh, MSA and the regional level. Um, let's see. So now let's go over uh, the state level. So uh, in all four of the critical years, we see that Illinois and either New York or New Jersey maintain the top two spots. But there is actually a lot of fluctuation. Um, there's actually a lot of fluctuation in uh, the year 2015 to 2019. And you can kind of see that regional switch to like uh, more southern states. So like you can see in 2019 that Texas is third and there's also Florida and North Carolina are nine and 10. Um, so we see this general trend uh, of switching to the south more as well. Um, now with regards to um, MSA, we can see that it's dominated by Chicago. Chicago actually has, I believe, five times more than the next biggest MSA, which is New York. Um, and we can, we'll see this uh, trend like discontinue as Chicago moves further and further down the list. Um, so moving on to 20, let me see. So moving on to uh, like the critical time of 2015 to 2019, um, we see that Chicago loses a lot of students. It's not even in the top 10 um in 2015 um, so it drops off quite a bit and then um, we can see the shift again to more southern cities uh from the shift from 2015 to 2019 so like here you see um houston miami and uh brownsville to harlington texas as well so in summary to sum up uh, basically the graphs and the tables. Um, we saw our first sharp decline in F1 vi uh, visa issuance uh, in the year 2008, and then it never really recovered back to the levels that it was pre-2008. Um, 
And then in 2009, there was also a sharp decline. Um, we saw in general on the regional level, well, really on all levels, that there was a general shift um, to the south after these critical periods. Um, we saw that on the state level, there is a concentration in Illinois and New York. And then on the MSA level, those cities were represented uh, Chicago and Illinois and New York City on the MSA level. Um, but we also saw those shifting towards Southern cities as you saw before. Um, uh, I also said in the future, we could use something like we used before, like HHI. Um, so like a market concentration index um, to really quantify how much uh, the shift is happening. Um, and so, yeah, so we see that international students are important for domestic students because they cross subsidize um, tuition. And we believe that understanding like what metropolitan statistical areas the Vishigar students are in is important because we know what areas would be most impacted by a change in the visa issuance or visa issuances. Um, and so we saw that there was a sharp decline in 2008 as well in 2019. Um, but we think it would be important to understand for future work, um, what is driving those individual changes? Was, there, was it um, something to do with foreign exchange or does it have to do something with uh, where they're going or something on the domestic side, on the sending side? We would like to look into that more and maybe even expanding the scope from Visegrad to Central and Eastern European students as well to understand that and hopefully find some more explanatory variables in the future. So yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any presentations that are a minute or two under length will be very appreciated with uh, a fact schedule. So um, next we will go to uh, our second presentation. So Pavel, Alexi, and Wojtek uh, are presenting about the importance of FinTech in the modern world. And if you could, again, just please introduce yourselves and um, what you're studying, where you're at in your studies, uh, that would be great. And I'll give you um, direct chats about um, some warnings for your time, okay? Sure. So hello everyone, my name is Paweł. I am currently a third year student of Quantitative Methods in Economics in Warsaw School of Economics. And today with me, there is also Wojciech and Alexi. So I am very pleased to present at the symposium on behalf of the ESCAN Startups and Innovations, operating as part of the student activity of the Warsaw School of Economics. Together with my partners, we have prepared a short speech on the essence of broadly defined fintech in the modern world, which I would like to present now. The topic actually is very close to us due to the fact that it indirectly concerns the subject of our club and the fact that we create an annual fintech online conference where extraordinary personalities from the world of Polish fintech take the floor. This year, we hosted among others, the person responsible for introducing the Revolt company known for international payments to Poland. Therefore, due to the fact that we devote the lion's share of the attention of our student club to the world of fintech, we decided to raise this topic. But what exactly the fintech is? This concept, although very popular, is not known to everyone. Fintech is a mixture of two words, financial and technologies, and describes the use of the latest and most modern solutions to improve financial services. That is, for example, taking loans, managing finances, or making online payments. The Irish National Digital Institute Center in Dublin defines FinTech as innovation in financial services. Simply put, FinTech means various types of technological or financial innovations. Some sources also give the definition of FinTech the sector of the economy, which includes all companies operating in the financial and technology industries. As we can see, it's not so easy to define this issue. However, to better understand the essence of this phenomenon, let's look at examples of fintech services around the world. First of all, online payment services, such as Zilla, that is American Bleak, Payu, and others like that. There are also communication services using online payments such as Uber or Airbnb. Another very important group, especially nowadays, are mobile applications for mobile payments, such as Google Pay, Apple Pay, and Android Pay. In addition, fintech services also include online exchange offices, services using blockchain, or peer-to-peer -peer loans. 
Knowing the essence of the phenomenon of fine tech, we can go to the heart of my speech. That is to the importance of its branch in the modern world. The digital revolution resulting from the dynamic technological progress covers almost all aspects of social and economic life in a global perspective. And is also an important factor in the transformation of the financial services market. Companies of the so-called new technologies such as Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon influence business strategies and consumer behavior patterns through the rapid diffusion of innovation in society. As a result, many companies in the banking and financial sectors have started to incorporate technology in their solutions around the world. Countries and regions around the world focus on financing the fintech sector to enable its significant growth. To better represent the essence of this progress, I will briefly follow the 2020 data on given cities in the world and their activities in the field of fintech. In the USA, in terms of finance and technology, each of us associates two cities, namely that is New York and San Francisco. And indeed, San Francisco is the undisputed fintech capital of the United States. Local companies raised over $13 billion from funds. The city won, advancing by as many as 11 positions, in the latest ranking, the Global Fintech Index 2020. In spite of the fact that New York cannot boast as many fintech unicorns as San Francisco, this city has one unquestionable advantage. that doesn't allow it to leave the top places in all possible rankings. It is the financial capital of the world. Fintech companies necessarily have to cooperate with market regulators, financial institutions, and banks. The US fintech market do not consist only of those two cities, but also includes cities such as Austin, where more than 130 fintechs are located. There are even more technology companies in Austin, about 6,000, and they are responsible for 40.6% employment. That is that twice the average for the entire United States. An important city in this matter is also Atlanta, where Atlanta Technology Village is located, which is the fourth largest technology center in the USA. But let's move on to Europe, which is also not on behind on the fintech market. London and then nothing for a long, long time. Simply put, this is how you can describe the presence of the largest fintechs in Europe. What London means is the biggest and the best fintech founding. The latest list of top European companies of this type, Sifted has prepared it together with the Financial Times and DealRoom.com based on valuation, shows that as many as 68 out of 153 are based in London. For comparison, in Paris, 14, in Stockholm, 5, and in Warsaw, only 2. Berlin is also important in Europe, despite the fact that the German market has met the requirements of contactless payments very late. However, what the capital of Germany is winning is that 15 top European fintechs were founded in Berlin, including probably the most famous one, uh, that is N26. It's a German neobank based in Berlin, Germany. It is de facto a bank in a smartphone, which its value is estimated at nearly 3.2 billion euros. According to a report by three respected research institutions, Cambridge University, Zhejiang University, and Sinai Labs, four of the seven sub-cities are in China, Beijing, first position, Shanghai, Hangzhou, and Shenzhen, positions five to seven. In Beijing alone, there are 58 leading fintechs, such as JD Finance, Duxiaoman Financial, or Quadian, which have received funding of over $21 billion in total. The African market, however, is not indifferent to global technological trends. Certain countries are even predestinated to take over at some point. According to World Bank data, the three largest African economies, Nigeria, Angola, and South Africa, play an important role in building the economy of the whole Africa. This is where fintechs are also developing more and more dynamically. An ideal example is Lagos where there is also a huge number of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. We are talking about 37 million SMEs representing 90% of all companies and making up 80% of jobs. 40% of the population still doesn't have access to traditional banking services. Such business environment always supports the emergence of fintechs. However, there are many challenges. 
nearly every part of Nigeria doesn't have an ID card, and only 55.6 million people have access to the internet. Those obstacles are difficult to overcome, but it doesn't change the fact that Africa and emerging markets may be the future of the financial technologies. Fintech is undeniable one of the most driving branches in the modern world. Nowadays, it is present in almost every aspect of modern life. As we can assume from above mentioned data and examples, it has a great growth potential. To sum up, I can clearly emphasize the fact that the sector of financial technologies is the presence and the future of broadly defined financial technologies. Thank you. Okay, Pavel, thank you very much. Um, so our third presentation is going to be by Oscar, um, who's a GOED intern. Um, and for those of you who don't know, that GOED is the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Um, Pavel works. And Oscar will be presenting on understanding, <coughs> sorry, understanding entrepreneurial indicators across the US. Oscar, take it away and keep your chat open and I'll just give you some warnings on time limits, okay? Perfect, thank you. I wanna make sure I'm sharing the right thing. Um, do we see it in full screen? Just making sure. Yes, yes we do. Perfect. So. Hello, everybody. My name is Oscar Lloyd. I am currently a, the intern for the Governor's Office of Economic Development, as well as a senior for the University of Nevada, Reno. And today, I'm going to be discussing understanding entrepreneurial indicators across the United States. So starting off for the introduction, I've separated my presentation to four different sections. The first one is going through the Kauffman Foundation indicators and research across different states and seeing how Nevada fares within them. The next one, I went to the United States Census to understand how Nevada has done, especially during these pandemic times and understanding how businesses, especially startups have been doing. The third one is looking at PitchBook and seeing overall what the AUM, the assets under management of Nevada and neighboring states looks like and how the overall AUM has changed since 2005 to 2019 and then going through the overall rankings of Nevada and understanding better where we are as a state. So the first one that we have is the rate of new entrepreneurs. The rate of new entrepreneurs uh, provides a broad measure of entrepreneurship, which captures all new business owners, regardless of business size origin. So this is one of the first ones that we have, and it kind of looks at the overall brand, broad view of understanding what the rate of new entrepreneurs looks like. This one just is talking about just any type of business, no matter what industry. And as we see that the red bar and all these graphs in the Kauffman Foundation are the average of the 50 states plus DC. So overall, Nevada is around 23rd. And we see that overall compared to um, our neighbor states, we're doing pretty well. But going forward, what is more important is the opportunity share of new entrepreneurs. And this provides a broad insight into the influence of economic conditions on overall business creation among new entrepreneurs. Essentially, what this is discussing is based on state to state, on legislation, different policies, what is the opportunity and availability for entrepreneurs to start new businesses? From state to state, different laws or barriers of entry can prohibit different companies from forming easily. And unfortunately, Nevada doesn't have the best, but it does fare better than other states across the United States. And when it comes to understanding entrepreneurship, having the ability just to start is fundamental to everyone, not in just the United States, but across the world. And we're doing pretty well as a state overall. The third one is startup early job creation. And this one essentially tries to capture the early employment of the cohort of startup businesses in their first year. Looking at startups, we can look at them based on industry, but also the amount of time that is spent and them functioning within the working market. And this is by far Nevada's best indicator. So within the first year, essentially, a lot of startups have the ability to create new jobs for the employment market. And this is fundamental, especially during the COVID-19 times, because Nevada had a very high unemployment rate which led to many losing their jobs and having an unavailability to work. And the US Census will also reflect this uh, statistic 
but it shows that despite whatever happens within uh, even pandemic times or any kind of economic crisis, there is always an ability to start a company or start a, um, a startup and allow for new jobs to be creating. And startups are the number one uh, leading types of organizations that bring on new jobs. So this is a very important statistic for us as Nevada. The fourth one, and this is the last one for 2020, is the startup early survival rate. And this one reflects early stage business performance within the first year seeing how new employment, uh, new employer establishments are still active after one year of operation. So as I mentioned, you can also look at startups in the time horizon. And when we look at after one year, Nevada does very well on holding these organizations. And this can be accredited to not only the amount of resources that is available to Nevada and entrepreneurs, but also the different types of mentorship programs, accelerators, incubators, and different resources that are available to entrepreneurs which shows that with support and overall access to these uh, information, uh, there is an ability for entrepreneurs to maintain their businesses and let them grow over time. So the next two data sets are from 2018, but they discuss more from the employer side of entrepreneurship. And the first one overall is the rate of new employer business actualization. And this one reflects the proportion of all new business applications that become an employer business within eight quarters. Many times when we're working with startups, there isn't much funding or the availability for startups to be paying employees in their first couple of years. And this one, unfortunately, is the weakest indicator that we have for Nevada. And it shows that within two years, many startups struggle in order to not only fund, um, their employees, but are usually struggling from a financial aspect to have that payroll. And this is fundamental to the long-term success of any startup businesses. Without the ability to play, pay employees, retention tends to be very low, and the ability to grow and prosper over several years is much weaker. So unfortunately, this is one of our weaker indicators, but we have others that show the strength of Nevada overall. And the second one, again, a very strong indicator for us is the rate of new employer businesses, which simply reflects um, businesses within the population, no matter of time horizon, that allow uh, startups to get new employees, allow them to expand and operate in a much uh, more technical and uh, diverse market. So this one's showing that overall, when we look at much longer periods of time, Nevada tends to excel and uh, has the availability to have payroll pay for new employees, and then allow them to retain themselves into the market, which is very good for long-term retention for startup companies. Moving forward, as I said, we have the monthly business applications from the US Census. This one is essentially showing what types of businesses are being formed and how often are business applications being formed. On the right, we have the overall growth in the number of business applications that are being formed. And on the bottom left corner, I've also added a graph to show the relationship between these four. So business applications, the biggest one, we see that there's been a very high spike in start of 2020. This is during the pandemic times. And this shows great resilience of Nevadans that despite the COVID-19 pandemic and the great amount of unemployment that has occurred within our state, there was a high jump in entrepreneurs and people trying to start their own businesses in order to find means of pay and supporting themselves and their families. So this is one of our probably strongest indicators showing that Nevada overall is very resilient. And this also shows that as a state, we have several resources that give access to entrepreneurs and have the ability to start companies. Other states, when we look at the U.S. Census, do not have such a big jump in uh, business applications showing that those states don't have as many resources, availability, and knowledge to help entrepreneurs start their journeys. So corporations, uh, the high propensity, which is our second one, um, is essentially discussing um, S Corp and C Corp companies that have payroll. And then uh, corporations and planned wages are simply a more specifics of the types of um, wages and how early or how late employees are being paid while the business applications are biggest one takes in LLCs, sole proprietorships, partnerships, and all types of business applications. So there's a very high 
diversification beyond just corporations being formed in Nevada. And going on past looking at applications, it's important to understand the assets under management that we have by the state. And assets under management, AUM, is a frequent used metric for sizing total funds managed by a venture capital or private equity firm across a state or city. And as we see, Nevada has 84 million. And comparing to our other neighboring states, we are not doing the best. However, understanding this, when we look at California or um, different, or Washington or Utah, we're talking very high corporations and, of course, Silicon Valley, which leads to $257 billion. However, though this does not give justice to Nevada, I think it's more important to look at the AMU over the last couple of years. So focusing on this, we see that Nevada has had an overall rise in the amount of uh, AUM is coming under Nevada. And this is with the rise of smart cities such as Las Vegas, the overall innovation that the university has from both UNR and UNLV, and showing the overall growth as a state and our ability to bring in capital and investors and retain it. So in summary, what I have is the Kauffman indicators. Our best one was the startup early job creation where Nevada ranks in 12th. Unfortunately, our weakest one is the rate of employer businesses actualization, which is 40th. However, we see that for our first three, we are in the top 50% of states in our overall indicators, which is showing the overall growth of Nevada and our availability to help entrepreneurs and help them be sustainable throughout the years. The U.S. Census data shows that over 5,000 business applications were filed in 2021, showing that overall during the pandemic, entrepreneurs have been rising in order to find wages and support themselves. And through this, more jobs are being created, which is going to help us get out of our unemployment percentage, as we've been seeing overall. So even today, there's the drop in the percent. And with the pitch book, we see Nevada's AUU trends from 2005 to 2019 has been growing, indicating that funds are coming into the state to support businesses. And hopefully this trend will continue looking forward. But more importantly, on top of these indicators, though some of them might not be the strongest, I think it's also important to give credit to our two main cities that we have within Nevada and showing the kind of rankings that we have. Reno is, has been named the number one best small city in the United States and also the top post COVID-19 top mid-sized city to expand to or relocate to. So I've also given the sources and it's showing that when the COVID-19 pandemic is over, Reno is a ideal place for entrepreneurs to come to start up their businesses due to overall real estate and access to capital and resources. And with Las Vegas, it is a top 15 United States city for startups and was named number three city where it pays to be an entrepreneur. So overall, when we look at the biggest cities beyond the indicators, Nevada is an ideal home for entrepreneurs, startups, and anyone looking to start a business. And with that, I thank you all and ask for any questions. Okay, thanks, Oscar. We'll hold questions till the end. But um, next up is um, Avery, who will be presenting on international partners. Very uh, useful for this um, uh, conference. How international partners can learn from each other, working together to build entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Avery Callis and today I will be talking about how international or how international partner, partners can learn from each other working together to build entrepreneurial ecosystems. I'm a senior at UNR studying philosophy and international affairs. I'm also an intern for the International Division of GoEd. So on to, on to a brief introduction. I organized the, my presentation today into four main categories um, that I represent with questions. So first are how Nevada's two major cities, Las Vegas and Reno, are performing compared to other US entrepreneurial hubs. Second, where are Las Vegas and Reno's entrepreneurial ecosystem succeeding and failing? And third, how do Nevada's cities compare to other entrepreneurial ecosystems that perform similarly on a global scale? That brings me to my last question. How can we grow entrepreneurial ecosystems through global partnerships? 
So the presentation today will be based on data from Startup Genome, a company that works with various government and private organizations around the world to evaluate the strength of city entrepreneurial ecosystems. Each year, they release a report based on the previous year's data to rank and analyze different ecosystems around the world using the same levels of assessment. Their assessment highlights one list of the top 30 environment um, ecosystems on one list, and the second list is a top 100 emerging ecosystems that follows directly behind that 30 list. Um, there will be also four main indicators that I'll be using to discuss the success of ecosystems. The first is the overall performance, or rather how these cities are doing holistically. Second is funding, which indicates the financial opportunities for cities to be successful, ranging from grants to also private investment. Third, market reach is how these ecosystems are connected to other hubs in the region and internationally. And the fourth indicator is that of talent, including the amount of people, retention, and the type of people needed to create startups. I also color-coded a lot of my um, tables today as a way to just visually represent the values that we are gonna see. So my work for GoEd has been mainly focusing on analyzing Nevada's ecosystem, um, environmental ecosystem. So of course I started small, um, looking to how Las Vegas and Reno compared to the top 10 US ecosystems. As you can see, they both fall very short um, by the cooler tones in the table. Las Vegas has higher funding values and Reno has a market reach that is comparable to others. They're not nearly as well rounded as some of the top US hubs. If we look to this table as a graph with the top five cities that I mentioned on that table, um, we can see the shortfalls of these two ecosystems a lot more clearly um, compared to these five cities. So Las Vegas has performance and funding that is pretty similar to Seattle, which is actually ranked the ninth, ecos ninth best ecosystem in the world. Reno is equal in market reach to Seattle, which is extremely noteworthy as we continue the rest of our analysis. So as I did some more research, I wanted to see how Nevada's individual hubs compared to other global cities with similar rankings. So how the emerging um, list works is that they kind of group um, cities from 50 or from 40 and below in groups of 10 about uh, so that these ecosystems are relatively tied. So how do these cities have similar patterns to others? I want to start with Las Vegas because it's ranked higher on the emerging list, tied 41 through 50. Um, Uh, once I put it into tables, I found that most of these cities were doing moderate and performance, despite being on the lower side of things like market reach um, and just not being overall, overall, overall well-rounded ecosystems. So graphing these cities made it even more noticeable to see how similar the overall performance of Las Vegas is compared to these other global cities. They have high rankings in noticeably funding and talent, yet all around low market reach that decreases their overall, overall performance. It seems that these places may have the means to operate strongly, but they're just very low in connectivity to both the region and global markets. So doing the same thing for Reno, I wanted to see if there's a sharp, uh, you can see that there's clearly just a sharp decrease in color. Um, this uh, Reno is tied in the 81 through 90 emerging on the emerging list um, with other global cities. And, but there are some uh, noticeably high points of color in the market reach and funding throughout this table. We're looking for a common trend for Reno in these cities. There seems to be just no clear trend. Um, instead, it seems that there are uh, there's like one or two indicators um, per city in which the city inherently excels in, whether that be market reach like for Reno or funding in Lithuania. Focusing on and addressing the areas um, that we need to, imp uh, need to improve on and also capitalizing on the main indicator that we are already succeeding in may be needed to help grow, our, uh, grow these ecosystems. So next, I wanted to do just a short analysis on these individual indicators for Las Vegas and Reno. So when looking at Nevada as a whole, there are some funding opportunities offered by the state through grants and incentives, most of which are exclusively also offered to Las Vegas, such as small business stabilization and even women's philanthropy um, grants. Uh, Reno and, and Las Vegas startups have other options for grants, including step in private, um, uh, private um, grants. But of course, Las Vegas is advanta um, advantaged by the fact that they have more opportunities for grants, likely because of their larger population. Also, I want to look at the universities in these two cities. So UNLV and UNR have um, SBIR and SAGE, but UNLV has a separate venture capital fund called RVF, which is more money available for young entrepreneurs from UNLV trying to create startups. Neither also I want to note promote any sort of funding opportunities for students who may have graduated out of the state or the country. So overall, my analysis here is that expanding state grants to improve private and improving private investment will likely increase the state uh, funding for the state um, for the state, statewide. <laughs> More exposure to state grants for Reno um, specifically will dramatically increase funding. 
So next, I wanted to take a look at market reach. So is market reach because of exclusive location or higher exports? Why are these numbers so different for Las Vegas and Reno? So Las Vegas is disconnected to many of the hubs in the region because majority of corporations here are large corporations focused on localized hospitality. Reno, on the other hand, is located significantly closer to the Bay Area, meaning Silicon Valley, um, which has a very which has the strongest um, eco startup ecosystem in the world. So they're better exposed to technology advancements and they're just better connected to other startup businesses. Um, this leads me to overall conclude that Las Vegas needs to mend their connection to the region a little bit. And this can be done by furthering ties with close cities like Reno or Los Angeles, which also ranks very high on the um, top 30 list. Um, and they can also expand their markets globally. Uh, Reno should also capitalize on their access to these powerhouses and use it to grow other, um, sort, uh, other shortcomings such as funding. So next I wanted to take a look at talent. Comprehending talent in Las Vegas and Reno is a little bit more difficult, even though both have their own state universities. Um, retention, especially in Reno, is a lot lower than Las Vegas. This probably is attributed to population. People who graduate from UNR might be more inclined to go to a city that's more highly populated, has um, more people available for the workforce. Um, this could attribute to the talent shortage that we see in Reno. So according to Forbes, diversity and immigration also seem to play as a major indicator for startup um, success. Las Vegas is significantly higher in immigration and racial diversity, which just creates that better um, ecosystem for startups. So last population in general could just also be another indicator of success for an ecosystem's talent. The more people who live in an area, the more likely people will be able to form a startup. So, Sorry, I'm on a different computer. Um, last, I just want to touch on overall performance of these regions um, before I get to this slide. I don't know where that one went. Um, Reno seems to be hanging on to by a thread due to their just geographical location prox and proximity to Silicon Valley, whereas Las Vegas has the type of people that are statistically likely to create flourishing startups as well as have the funding opportunities. Therefore, Las Vegas is performing better overall than Reno, but they don't have any particularly phenomenal contributions. So now as we analyze how different global partnerships can mutually benefit ecosystems. To do this, I wanted to take a look at some of the cities we are already partnered with. So on this slide, I took a look at how um, the schools that UNR School of Business has partners with abroad. By ranking these schools, it's clear to see that there could be some complementary partnerships right off the bat. So for example, of all our partners, um, ranks the highest, placing 20th in the world, but they may be aided by, say, Las Vegas and Zurich because they have better funding opportunities. Warsaw is another um, good place to look at for their talent and funding would also benefit Reno, whereas Reno's market reach would be um, substantially increased, um, would, would substantially increase Warsaw's connectedness to uh, global entrepreneurial communities. I'll touch on this a bit later. So moving on to global partners, um, some that we have already established partners with um, GoEd. So many of these partners rank much higher than Reno and Las Vegas, um, coming, many coming within the top 20 ecosystems in the world. Uh, we may be able to model and learn from these ecosystems and learn from their high performance uh, moving forward. Because these partnerships are already in place, we have a better avenue for cooperation and collaboration with these communities so that we can better learn from them while also strengthening theirs. This leads me to an analysis of the mutual beneficial partnerships. Um, I just want to touch mostly on Reno and Warsaw, for example. So this is probably the most one of the most complementary relationships out, uh, on that table. Um, Warsaw ranks between Las Vegas and Reno on that emerging list, um, uh, ranked within the 60s. So Reno has, again, very high market reach, which uh, with lower talent and funding, whereas Warsaw has moderate talent and funding, but a lower market reach. So through a partnership, Warsaw will likely be able to increase their global market reach to hubs specifically in North America, Northern Northern America, to be precise. And Reno's talent will, um, uh, talent and funding will also increase through this, uh, through this partnership. Uh, if we also look at um, Reno and Las Vegas creating more connectivity. Uh, Reno and Las Vegas are also complementary. Las Vegas thrives in funding despite lower scores elsewhere. And Reno, again, strives in that market reach. So together, Las Vegas will better access nor um, Northern American markets. And Reno will just improve holistically because they'll have better access to talent and funding. Um, another partnership I want to mention is uh, Las Vegas and Ljubljana. 
So Las Vegas has high performance and low market reach. Ljubljana has low performance, but higher market reach. Talent levels are very similar, but with the collaboration, Las Vegas will increase their global market reach and Ljubljana will increase their performance overall because they'll have better access to, um, uh, to the global markets through a collaboration here. And one more, not partnership, but more of like a bi, um, multilateral partnership. Seoul is in general doing very well. Um, they've been increasing um, exponentially on that start on that top 30 list. Um, but again, there's always room for better funding and market reach per their values on the previous tables. So with the unique placement of Reno and the funding opportunities in Las Vegas, this would also be a very good collaboration for both parties to grow. So this leads me to my closing remarks and a summary. So first, um, my first question I wanted to try to answer through this presentation was, how are these cities preferring, um, performing compared to other US entrepreneurial hubs? So strong ecosystems in the US thrive when they are well-rounded, and Nevada cities have some key shortfalls that prevent more than a moderate overall performance. And second, where are Las Vegas and Reno's entrepreneurial ecosystem succeeding and failing? Well, Las Vegas and Reno both follow different trends with very specific needs that should be honed in on. Las Vegas exceeds Reno in funding, talent, and performance, but fails to be connected. Reno, again, has that higher market reach, but low funding and talent really holds Reno back from the possibilities that they have being so close to Silicon Valley. Third, how do Nevada cities compare to other global ecosystems? Well, Las Vegas and Reno are complementary to many of our global partners, both with you and our School of Business and GoEd. Um, although majority of our partners are performing better in terms of rankings, so they would be um, cities that we can use as modeling and as sources for information about how we can improve our own cities, as well as develop partnerships, which then again goes to answer um, my fourth question today, which is how can we grow our entrepreneurial ecosystems through partnerships. And this is because uh, global partnerships provide fruitful opportunities, not only for collaboration, but also for strengthening ecosystems by, by focusing on our complementary relationships. By emphasizing our strongest attribute to create better partnerships and address our low performing ones, we can create stronger, more well-rounded ecosystems for Nevada and beyond. And thank you, and I'm open for questions. Avery, thanks. When it, I always appreciate when people set their own timers so I don't have to. Uh, um, okay, thank you for that. You're fine on time there. Um, we'll hold questions at the end again, but um, uh, we're actually a little ahead of schedule. So uh, Dominique, you are up next and you'll be presenting on the role of uh, social, economic, and political environment and the incidents and severity of, of COVID. Um, so you have uh, 12 minutes for this, okay? Perfect, thank you. All right, so I'd like to confirm that everyone can see the uh, PowerPoint deck. Yes, we can. Okay. See. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, uh, so thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Dominique Brewer. I am a finance and economics major for the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, additionally, I have a career in uh, the financial sector for uh, financials and for analytics. Uh, so today, what I'd like to do is to discuss the relationship of social, cultural, and really the political environment um, that really has an impact on the various countries impacted by COVID. Um, and to be able to take a look at how those different relationships impact severity and spread really within the first initial eight months. Um, so in working with uh, Dr. AR, uh, I became interested in the disparity of COVID profiles across each country. And we can see that there is a wide array in how this disease really emerged. Uh, so for example, what we have here is a sample of the seven day average new caseload by country um, in those initial eight months. And our overarching focus was really on those peaks and to be able to determine why, for example, the countries on the left peaked at that certain time frame versus the countries on the right. And if we can really find the key determinants that we can replicate to see again, what that relationship is and why COVID emerged so differently across different nations. So for our main motivation, uh, when seeking to answer these whys uh, behind the variation, we really need to know um, if there are any consistent and again, replicable factors uh, that existed to mitigate the disease spread. And in reading the socioeconomic determinants of COVID spread, there were 31 factors that were identified and tested. Um, of those, only three were found to be statistically significant, 
Uh, those would be obesity, age mix of the population, and population density. Uh, the other path to answer the why is the role that behavior and response plays in the pandemic environment. And in reading the economic impact of government interventions, the relationship between government interventions, consumer behavior, um, and the resulting economic outcomes in the international stock market were tested. And what was found is that in the case, um, especially for the Spanish flu in 1918, government interventions amidst pandemics did have a positive medium run impact on the economy, but of course have a uh, negative short run impact. Um, as seen with COVID, there were similar short run economic impacts that were detrimental, um, especially in cases where stay at home orders were implemented and other isolation policies were instituted. And so these two research papers were directionally very helpful, um, but still left several questions unanswered uh, and didn't really provide a replicable model for us to be able to safeguard especially against the next outbreak of, of any future zoonotic diseases. And so we really wanted to understand what the role of preparedness, social constructs, and political sentiment were in disease mitigation. And additionally, how can we explain the varied uh, pandemic profiles that we just saw? And what you know, different factors contribute to the differences in emergence and severity in each country? Um, and you know, an important component of that is the role that the population plays in both response and adherence. As we know, this pandemic was highly polarizing, especially for a global healthcare crisis. Um, and public response, you know, in some cases led to aggression, insubordination, some irrational consumer behavior. And again, we want to understand how these factors really amplified um, certain government interventions as well as other social constructs that existed. And so specifically when looking at the pre-emergence environment, uh, of each country, we sought to understand how the previous in infrastructure helped or hurt each country's outcomes, um, and specifically around the healthcare system efficiency. Um, does a better, you know, healthcare system mean that there are less negative outcomes overall, um, you know, despite having emergence occur? Um, for political polarization, does a more polarized or dichotomous environment um, make a country's position worse? And how does that impact social adherence and behavior? Additionally, we sought to understand um, behavior. Can we correlate you know, the different behavioral markers such as risk aversion um, or indulgence restraint of a society and their ability to adhere to messaging? Um, and what development markers existed like GDP um, and how that development index helped or hurt each country's profile? Additionally, we want to understand how did early response reduce or make worse the spread and the overall severity? Did emergency safety nets play a strong role in minimizing time at work or social interactions um, or economic burnout? And if so, how relevant was the overall generosity of such safety nets? Additionally, you know, were debt relief programs beneficial such as single contract relief or um, were more broad debt relief programs more effective such as you know, a halt on all national debt paybacks? And how did government stringency and trust matter? And how did that previous polarity impact social adherence and public response? Or simply put, are countries that are more, more polarized less likely to adhere to messaging? And can we see a relationship between adherence and social response in the face of government policy? As seen previously, uh, public response varied quite globally. And then to answer that, we looked at 88 countries initially and finally reviewed 48 based on the strength of the available data. We looked at countries with over 300,000 in population density, and our study represents over 50% of the global population and a share of 30% of cases globally through August 31st. Of those 48 countries, we tested a host of different variables. We looked at new daily case count, uh, courtesy of Our World in Data and Johns Hopkins. Additionally, trailing three-year political polarization, um, an index from the IDB, we used Hofstede's cultural dimensions of national culture as a measure of risk aversion and indulgence versus restraint. Uh, we used IMF's policy response tracker uh, to better understand isolation and quarantine initiatives. Uh, we used Google's mobility tracker to assess changes in visit frequency uh, compared to a February baseline. Uh, we used Oxford's response tracker for national markers such as stringency, GDP, population, income, and debt relief. And then finally, we used WHO's healthcare system efficiency ranking 
uh, which measures each country's healthcare infrastructure's actual performance against its estimated optimized levels. And once we compiled these data sets, we applied the following methods to best match our research questions. We applied a seven day rolling average to new case counts to identify each country's individual peak. We also took the Google mobility data and adjusted two weeks prior um, to account for the latency and lag effect that, po that population mobility and visits play on you know, the overall emergence of the disease two weeks later. Addition, addi additionally, we looked at the frequency of safety nets that were implemented in each country. And we used Python and Stata to cleanse our data, combine our data, and to perform regressions. Uh, and lastly, we used robust standard errors as well. And for our regressions, we look at the above variables and looked at the impact on log deaths per million, uh, log cases per million, log days to first peak, and finally log cases at peak for each country. And we found several very interesting relationships, such as the correlation of healthcare effectiveness on log deaths per million by political uh, polarity as seen here. Um, so what we were able to determine is that moderately polarized nations, those with a, a healthy balance, so to speak, saw a higher degree of change in deaths per million, but as you can see, had less sample deaths over the mean. Uh, while extreme polar polarity or totalitarian systems saw a stronger impact on deaths, meaning those countries with more political polarity or no political freedom um, saw more deaths per million than those that were you know, healthy in their polarity. Additionally, we saw that any level of debt was helpful in reducing cases per million when comparing cases to high levels of less time spent at work in the face of quarantine policies. So again, those interaction variables of um, isolation policies and time spent at work. Um, and we were really able to see that in nations with no debt relief as seen on the left, um, prior to their peak, or I'm sorry, with, in nations with no debt relief that occurred prior to their peak, um, so they did not support their population as well, there was an increase in cases per million over the initial eight months. Versus if you look in the middle, nations with more narrow debt relief or even a broader range of debt relief uh, were able to reduce their overall cases per million. And our results, when looking at our pre-emergence variables, so again, our percent of population per age mix, our log GDP per capita, our healthcare system efficiency, moderate political polarization versus extreme political polarization, uh, cultural risk aversion and cultural indulgence versus restraint, uh, we were able to see the following results. Um, so for example, for GDP, uh, for every dollar in GDP increase, uh, cases increased by 30% as well, uh, showing us that cases to GDP are actually inelastic. Additionally, moderate political uh, polarization res uh, resulted in a longer time to peak or a flatter curve, if you will. So from the time that COVID emerged to when that country hit their peak, there was more time in between, meaning that that ramp up was less severe. Additionally, when you couple that with a population that prior to the pandemic uh, was less likely to restrain from indulgence, uh, meaning that they're a more indulgent culture overall. Uh, there was actually half a percent increase on time to peak, again, indicating a relationship between healthy political polarity and uh, population adherence. Uh, for risk aversion, counterintuitively, actually we saw roughly a 2% increase in cases and deaths in nations with a more risk averse population. Um, and while that's opposite to my initial assumption, uh, this can really help us show the relationship in the increase in consumer behavior at grocery stores and pharmacies um, and help us understand that that more you know, prepared sector of businesses was actually visited more frequently. Um, and that overall cases actually increased when visits to those more prepared sectors increase as well, um, showing that the population is more likely to overreact or overprepare. Um, especially if they are typically more risk averse. And for our variables that impacted early response, so um, for the first uh, six, we're looking at those um, interaction variables. So weighting uh, the change in visits for um, recreational or consumer behaviors in the face of stay at home orders. We're looking at the change in grocery store and over the counter consumer visits in the change of stay at home orders. Um, the change in time spent at residence uh, the change in public transport usage, 
um, and the change in time spent at parks as well as the time spent uh, at workplaces. Um, and we're also looking at those emergency safety nets. So narrow debt relief or single contract debt relief versus a broad debt relief. So um, more than one, uh, typically a suite of halts on uh, debt payback. And then we're also looking at the different emergence of emergency safety nets as it relates to income support. So we're looking at um, if there was less than 50% of income support available or more than 50 or more than 50% of income support available. Um, as a portion of household income. And so for those early response variables, we were actually able to see uh, the interaction effect of a decrease in public transport usage surrounding those stay-at-home orders. Um, also was able to cause a decrease um, in cases by about half a percent. Um, and while certain results did not align with our initial questions, uh, we definitely believe that this speaks to the emerging theme of overall underpreparedness, um, both socially and politically and the resulting population behavior as well. And so overall, what we were able to conclude is that we found um, that for a pre-emergence environment, the three strongest factors to really mitigate disease spread and severity, um, it's going to be those cultural behavioral responses. So how the individual population responds, um, and that's seen with our risk aversion metrics as well as our you know, indulgence versus restraint metrics, um, political polarity. Um, if there's a healthy degree of political freedom and some polarity, um, those nations are better suited or were better suited in those first eight months to handle the emergence of COVID um, and better able to mitigate either overall cases or overall deaths as opposed to more single party or highly polarized nations. Um, and lastly, for pre-emergence, um, economic development played a significant role. So again, GDP, um, but also that sets up countries ability to really implement those emergency safety nets as well. And then for early response behavior, so once the pandemic occurred, um, the three largest determinants were government sponsored safety nets. Um, and to go back to our initial questions surrounding safety nets, uh, the degree of generosity was not as important as just the existence of them whatsoever. Um, and then for discretionary mobility behavior, that's the um, society's ability to self-monitor their behavior and either increase or decrease um, you know, discretionary visits as suited for the pandemic. And we saw that that was a large contributing factor. And lastly, the closure of businesses and schools and the shift in workplace patterns as they interacted with different government policies were also highly impactful for reducing the overall uh, detriment or negative outcomes um, that each country faced in the wake of COVID. And without um, any more, I'd like to open it up for questions or Todd, I'm not sure if we're going to go in a, in a different order for questions, um, but I wanted to thank you all for joining today. And we are very excited for what we were able to uh, um, come up with today. Okay, that's great. I'll just ask to end the, sh uh, the screen share so we can have the whole, the, the, the bigger uh, Zoom windows open. Thank you. Um, so I'm happy to just open this up to the floor for questions on any paper. Um, so does anybody have any questions on any paper? So maybe, maybe yes, maybe I will start. So actually I have two, two sets of the questions to two presentations. So maybe I will start with the, with the first one. So maybe I will start with, uh, uh, let me say with Oscar. Uh, uh, just two things, one, one, one question and one probably uh, a kind request for, for comment. So, First thing, uh, you presented very interesting jump in one of your slides, very interesting jump of the entrepreneurial activity during COVID-19 in Nevada. So very, very unusual uh, 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 skyrocketing, I would say. And if you can comment uh, but uh, the situation, because at the same time, uh, the unemployment in Nevada, especially in the southern part of the state, also, also jumped. Yes, so we're one of the of the highest in the nation. So, can you uh, can you comment on that? That we have a you know jump in the entrepreneurial activity, but at the same time we have uh, we have quite quite a big, big unemployment. It's it's just just this is the, for the clarification. 
but the, uh, another another question to you is that you presented this uh, assets under management and uh, it's, 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 it's a very good analysis but uh, what I when I look at this in a we are a relatively small state around uh, uh, surrounding by the bigger players so uh, I understand that, that that wasn't you know uh, that wasn't in relation to uh, the the size of the population. Why I am asking? Because in many times uh, smaller cities are, are are compared with the smaller ecosystems in in those assets and bigger. Uh, or mid, 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 mid-sized cities like Las Vegas are, are compared to mid-sized, not the not the, the biggest ones. So, my question is that have you have you tried also to to relate it uh, to uh, to the to the I don't know probably population? Yes. Yeah, so to answer the first one, in terms of the high increase in unemployment versus the high jump in business, um, in Nevada, especially on the south, we have a lot of hospitality industry. And due to COVID-19 industries such as hospitality, especially casinos or any sort of entertainment was automatically shut down to close. And that is a large majority of um, jobs available, especially in Las Vegas. So when you look at that jump, we're talking about thousands upon thousands of people suddenly losing their jobs to COVID-19. Unfortunately, for industries such as hospitality, there wasn't much area to pivot. Other companies such as restaurants or other industries have the ability to pivot for restaurants had the just the order pickup or had DoorDash. I'm talking about hospitality, travel is the key asset and function of it. And with borders being closed and people not allowed to be in hotels or gambling, thousands of people suddenly lost their job and there's no options to pivot or allow for any sort of retention of employees. So when we're looking at those numbers and understanding it, there's going to be significantly much more job loss rather than companies being started. So to the thousands of the hospitality workers that were lost, when we're talking about startups, we're usually talking about a very small group of people, if not one. Entrepreneurs tend to work in either solo with sole proprietorships. And as we saw on the BA for business applications, it takes in the entire scope. And when we take out high propensity businesses and corporations, a majority of them would have been LLCs or sole proprietorship or partnerships. So we're talking from a range to one to a maximum of usually five people. So when we try to compare those numbers, we see there's a very thousands of people difference. So despite the fact that there is such a high jump in entrepreneurship, it cannot rival the thousands of jobs lost in the hospitality industry. So that's the differentiation between the two. And in talking about AUM, there is, I did start going into the thousands and Las Vegas as a bigger city ranked 50th among uh, larger cities in uh, per capita per person of population. Uh, obviously much as larger cities and, and we're talking larger as in the main uh, cities of the states, we were actually ranked 50th. And I believe that was out of 178, if I remember correctly of large city categorizations. So we're doing well as Las Vegas, but unfortunately, Reno was ranked 250th out of, if I remember correctly, around 700 cities. So it's still doing well, but on the midsize and large size, both Vegas and Reno tend to be more central. And we haven't, we are not on the far end top 10% of these cities. But again, um, with the limit of the city's size and rising technologies, I'm going to presume that these numbers will rise over time. But overall, we're doing well as a state, but not as good as other cities in general. So, so what, what you are saying, thank you, Oscar, for this, because my, my second, maybe second, uh, second part of two questions are going to, uh, to Avri, but basically your findings are in line with her, because what you are saying basically is that Las Vegas is better on the kind of the capitalization of the, and the access of funding, and Reno is really not in the good positions there. And uh, really it, it basically shows also from the different methodology, but it, it shows also at uh, every uh, uh, every uh, uh, research and uh, every for, for, for you just one comment and one question uh, uh, because uh, basically uh, I, I really like this uh, 
comparison uh, through those four sub indicators that uh, we can compare also international partners and see who is uh, who, who can learn from whom uh, but uh, you know to be to be very uh, uh, to, to make the very firm uh, firm hypothesis here or to prove something you uh, basically we have to de-aggregate a bit uh, probably those four uh, sub indicators like for example talent yes we we need to know what kind of the talent we are about what kind of the talent uh, you know uh, criteria we are talking about so just giving an example that uh, uh, I, I wouldn't like to give the certain percentage but I have to tell you that uh, when te Tesla uh, uh, Giga factory was built uh, almost on the border of California yes in, in uh, near Reno it, the situation is that uh, quite a number I, I don't remember the percentage but quite a percentage of the employees are still living in california for example and coming back and forth to, to this so this talent could be could be measured uh, you know could give a, uh, we have to go a bit deeper uh, into those those four performances but uh, what i like to tell you uh, as, a, as a my final thought in that is that what you uh, did to, regarding Las Vegas and Reno, basically you have proven that uh, those systems are, are complementary ecosystems. So it may be very useful information for, uh, for the policies right now being designed in, in Nevada regarding also that uh, the, the two, those two ecosystems also in the infrastructure point of view. So I'm talking about Las Vegas and Reno are uh, way disconnected uh, than they should. Uh, so they are not connected almost at all. When you look on different data on trade, you are doing different data on infrastructure, different data on transportation, those two ecosystems are disconnected. And uh, so, so basically Reno is more connected to uh, Northern California and uh, Las Vegas more to, let's say, Southern agglomerations, including or, or uh, in, in that case, in most cases, Los Angeles. So having that in mind, uh, your, if, if you could dig in uh, the, the, this hypothesis that, uh, that those, those uh, ecosystem could learn from each other and could, could add value. Uh, that could be a kind of the, also a breakthrough argument that we, we have to invest in more, more connectivity uh, between the North and the South of, of the, can you, can you comment uh, every on, on, on that, uh, especially this co co complementary ecosystems, what you found? Oh, absolutely. Um, just touching back to something you were saying about infrastructure. So it's very interesting because I definitely agree with you. The infrastructure in Las Vegas is very centralized. They're focused mainly on their um, primary like economic um, source of um, a source of money, I guess, <laughs> um, in their hospitality sector. And they do very little um, involvement within the region, um, like extending to California, whereas Reno, the infrastructure in Reno, especially up here by like, 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 by Lake Tahoe, like we're sharing a border, like very, very close to um, California, of course. And a lot of our markets extend through California. We have like, in, uh, we uh, just in general, like we're constantly going between California and Reno because of the close proximity, um, which is a very different um, infrastructure that allows businesses to have better cooperation with California just solely because of proximity. Um, even though Las Vegas is very close to California, um, but in the Southern region, they don't have that same sort of connectivity. So we see that if Las Vegas wants to grow their um, entrepreneurial ecosystem, which I think we should, because you know, strong entrepreneurial ecosystems create billions of dollars in revenue. Like we need to look at how these two individual uh, infrastructures are um, functioning and find a way to create connectedness, especially since we are in the same state, we have state funds that are available to um, many businesses throughout the state. We can definitely find a way to grow a more comprehensive um, statewide entrepreneurial ecosystem that connects these two regions and uses the fact that Reno's already close to California as a way to kind of model some new approaches to changing the infrastructure in Las Vegas. And similarly, we can look to see how Las Vegas is using their talent, using their um, funding and resources and creating these startup um, um, businesses down in Las Vegas as a way to model how Reno can change their infrastructure, well, um, mostly as a city and region um, to better um, 
create those sorts of startups that are really missing in uh, Reno right now. So focusing on that complementary relationship and learning from each other is I think like of utmost importance if we're trying to grow any sort of entrepreneurial ecosystem. And this extends of course to global communities, specifically Warsaw I saw would be one of the best complementary relationships with um, Reno because they are exceedingly high in funding and talent, which is something that Reno is lacking. And so by creating a better relationship, we can give Warsaw a connectedness to California, to that Bay Area to Silicon Valley, um, grow their global um, footprint, while also finding a way to increase talent um, for both cities. I, I did have one question for, for Dominique. Was there any uh, countries specifically that were kind of in that sweet spot of polarization or inequality that you found? Uh, yes, typically that was centered around like more developed countries in Europe. Um, and to give some context, for example, uh, Great Britain was a two, so that they're you know more moderate. Um, and then for the United States, they were actually a, a three. And, and so the how the breakdown works is it's a it's a range of zero um, zero one or two. I'm sorry. So um, the United States was a two. So it's a range of zero one or two. Zero being their single party systems. They have not had an election had an election in over five years. And then the ones and twos are based on uh, population mix. Um, and overall incumbent party mix. Um, so, and that's to account for the different political systems. So to answer your question, the more moderate uh, countries were typically like uh, European nations that were more developed, for example, New Zealand, Sweden. Okay. With Sweden possibly being an exception because of their policy. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> Bennett, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, hi, uh, kind of a, a, a follow-up question to Dominique. So. Um, you know, first of all, like, you know, really interesting presentation. So thanks for the, um, uh, the presentation. Thanks for the work. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, we, uh, I, I was looking at a kind of like a similar data, but like I was interested in looking at the relationship of, you know, COVID-19 cases, deaths. Uh, I was also looking at case fatality rates um, to the um, decentralization in the government, because as you know, like, you know, there's a lot of uh, criticism about like, you know, uh, local governments uh, not having enough capacity to, you know, address the, uh, the, the COVID crisis and then, you know, central and local governments are not working well together. So um, uh, now I, I didn't run any regressions. So I was uh, looking at just like simple correlations. And I actually found out that at the time uh, that there's this, um, uh, like the places that are more decentralized uh, actually ended up uh, having like, you know, more uh, COVID, uh, uh, you know, cases and deaths, which was, uh, which is little counterintuitive, right? So um, uh, I, I think you are looking at the political polarization. So uh, did you get a chance to like, you know, look at that or like consider um, like, you know, that aspect as well? I did not. And I think that that's a very interesting way to break it out. We were looking more uh, globally. And so political polarization, from, from our perspective was a great index to be able to measure um, the different policy initiatives and to be able to relate those initiatives to public response if there's more um, you know, polarity within society as it relates to government. I think that the, the concept of centralization versus decentralization is very interesting. And I, it, it can track, you know, especially as you brought up with you know, more municipalities means more options and more, you know, disagreement amongst policy implementation. Uh, but I did not look at that specifically, but that's a very interesting approach. Oh, Todd, you're, you're muted. 15 months, you think I'd figure this out. Um, <laughs> are there any questions on Pavel's question on FinTech? I, I would ask one of just about kind of um, what, what, if, what, sorry, and sorry if I missed this, but have you seen any changes in, in Poland or other places in Central Europe in terms of centralization within cities? Do you see any trends? Do you see more concentration over time or less concentration over time geographically within countries in Central Europe? And that's actually a very great idea. And I think that's a good topic even for a completely uh, new conference. Uh, frankly speaking, um, yes, I think that the centralization is happening. Uh, for example, in Warsaw, all the big companies here in Poland are moving there because of the labor and uh, the access to the labor. Uh, 
because uh, when let's say smart people that are very uh, worthy on the market on the labor market are moving on the to the bigger uh, cities in order to receive more money so yeah it's common in poland and i think that in uh, other uh, countries in europe as well okay thank you and are there any questions on the adam and, and skyler's uh, presentation on on international students in the us I have a quick question. Avery, please go ahead. Yeah, so I remember reading something in Forbes a while back about how um, people who have cross-country experiences, um, have lived in other countries, are more successful in creating startups. Do you think this would be um, something you find aligns with a lot of your research? Um, well, we, we, we kind of just looked into like the demographics more. Um, uh, I think that would be a good, um, something to regress on. Um, but yeah, we look at mostly, um, just like effects of, uh, like demographic concentration. Uh, but I'm sure like, um, the movement, like I'm networks plays a big part in it. And I'm sure the movement has a lot to do with, uh, entrepreneurial activity in those places. And there was a, a paper that I read that said that international students were more likely to study STEM and business. And I think that's a much more likely pipeline into an entrepreneurial job rather than, you know, coming here and doing like agriculture or something. So yes, I think they probably have a higher chance of doing so, or at least working in a startup in kind of a newer field. Yeah, kind of in terms I of had, increasing I had talent. One question. Go ahead, please, Jim. Yep. So I don't know if you guys purposely danced around it, but your data was 2016 to 2019, there was a uh, decrease in transfers. Is that likely due to the Trump administration? Um, we haven't identified um, any policy so far, but uh, that certainly could be, could be a reason. But you also did see, I, I had no doubt that played a part, but I thought one interesting thing you found is that there was a long decline ever since 2008 or so, right? Yeah. Yeah, never really uh, recovered after uh, 2008. So 2019 kind of just extenuated an already uh, declining problem. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions from the floor? We can wrap up a few minutes early if people don't have other questions. But Okay. Um, I mean, I guess we could formally end this session if that's okay. And if anybody wants to stick around just to catch up for a few minutes, that might be um, a nice thing to do since we don't have the opportunity to do this uh, in between sessions with great um, hors d'oeuvres and et cetera in, in person. So I'm gonna call the session officially over and I'll hit the off on the record and we can um, maybe have a, a social few minutes here yeah. if you want. Uh, Todd, if I may, I'd like yes. to see quickly that, um... You know, I, I would really like to, you know, uh, express my thanks.